Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well today. I'm Abby O'Keefe, and I'm with Kentucky Spin, and we are so happy that you have joined us today for our presentation on transitioning to independent living for self-advocates. We really hope that this information will be useful to you, but we want to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So on your Zoom dashboard, you should see a Q&A box and a chat box. You can enter questions or comments in either box, and we will have some time set aside to address those questions near the end. We do have real-time captions that are available here in the Zoom session. So click on the closed caption button and select show subtitles to view those captions. There is also a link in the chat box to today's presentation, and any handouts that we discuss will also be linked in the chat box. If you do not have time to get to those, don't worry about it. A follow-up email will be sent to you by the end of the week with today's resources. So now, a little bit about Kentucky Spin. Kentucky Spin is funded by the U.S. Department of Education which is under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And we have been the Parent Training and Information Center since 1988. We provide families and professionals and individuals with training, information, and resources to become effective advocates for themselves or their loved ones, clients, or anyone with a disability. We also work with children and youth with all types of disabilities from birth to age 26. We do not act as attorneys. However, we do empower families to effectively advocate for their children or themselves. Our staff are either individuals with disabilities and or parents or siblings to someone with a disability. So now the exciting part, I am going to hand things over to our speaker, Nick Carpenter, and I will allow Nick to introduce himself. Take it away, Nick. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Nick Carpenter. I am the youth educator with Kentucky Spin. I'll talk a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, so the youth educator, what that role entails is that I am, I work with high school age youth, as well as young adults to help um, provide resources and trainings to give those youth uh, valuable transition skills to help them prepare for when they leave high school and go into the adult life, whether it be going into college, going into work, or just transitioning to living on their own, whatever it may be, I try to do my best using my own experiences and resources to help make that easier for other people because I didn't have a lot of that help when I was transitioning out of high school, so I'm trying to do my best to help um, help others. Sorry, I'm very distracted. My dog is stomping through my office space right now. And he is distracting me. So, but yeah, so that's what my job entails. Um, I'm 25 years old. I'll be 26 in December. I was diagnosed with autism at the age of four. And that has been a big kind of struggle for me off and on throughout my life. But I've been able to get the skills and resources I need to be productive from that. And again, and now I use my experiences and my journey into adulthood to help others with disabilities to help prepare them better. We'll go ahead and get on in here. So this slide here just talks about KY Spin. Abby already talked a little bit, but I'll just go over it again super quick. Um, so Kentucky Spin again, we're a a uh, special parent involvement network and we are a statewide kind of advocacy group we provide a bunch of free resources trainings support just about everything except like abby said we don't do like legal advice or represent people in court those are like the two things we don't do but we do just about everything else to help empower families and individuals with disabilities take care of themselves and live productive lives and another thing about kentucky spin that the abby may have mentioned is that everyone part of Kentucky Spin, everyone who's involved with it, who works for it, um, and kind of keeps it together, is either related to someone with a disability or has a disability themselves. 
So whenever someone comes to us needing support or help, they know that they're getting it from a peer and someone who's may has been involved in that kind of life already because everyone at Kentucky Spin has had to navigate the life of either helping someone or having a disability themselves. So it's always that nice um, knowing that you'll be understood. This tier just goes over what we do and what we don't do. So the Pacer Center. Uh, this training is made possible through, Pace, through Pacer's National Parent Center on Transition and Employment. Um, they kind of helped. Uh, we kind of adapted some of this training from them. So we just want to have a little shout out here for that. Uh, and again, uh, just before we get into it, this, this will be a pretty short presentation. It shouldn't take too long. Uh, and again, like Abby said, we'll have like a Q&A near the end. Um, I think we might have a few moments during where we might stop and ask questions. But yeah, we have a couple videos. I'm mainly just going to talk for about like 20 or 30 minutes. But we do have a couple videos that we're going to share uh, just to show you all the kind of get as an opening and a closing to the presentation. So here, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to our to Davis, who's our video guy today. And I'm going to show you a quick five minute video, and then I'll be back and we'll start the presentation. Welcome to the VCU ACE Ask the Expert series. I'm Josh Taylor, uh, here with my colleague Dr. Stacy Carr, and we're going to be talking about uh, transition planning, uh, specifically with uh, independent living. Uh, so Dr. Carr, uh, tell us a little bit, what are the things to keep in mind or the important parts about uh, getting ready for independent living transition? Independent living is beyond just independent living as far as housing, job, um, community engagement. It, it comes back to being able to be accountable for your own, your own well-being, and so things like choice making and problem solving are extremely important and those are the skills that really you should be working on in elementary school and preschool but in in high school that's absolutely the time to really hone in on those skills and things like um, being able to manage your own medication um, making choices throughout your day we make choices as soon as we wake up whether to press snooze or whether to actually get up um, and and making those choices throughout the day independently so whether it's with minimal support or or making the choice, and if you make a choice and it's a bad choice, that's okay. We can learn to live with that and learn how to deal with that and cope and manage appropriately. If we make a poor choice and engage in inappropriate behavior in high school, we have a support system there to help us. If we engage in bad behavior on the job, it gets a little bit more challenging. So that's one thing. The other thing is problem solving. Um, problem solving really helps uh, students navigate their um, independent life as far as um, managing their medication, making choices about their food, about their clothing, about their job, about um, friendships, about relationships, and being able to know what to do if something comes awry. So if there's um, no peanut butter in the house and you make peanut butter toast every morning for breakfast, what are you going to do? Are you going to not go into work that day or are you going to decide to have something else? And so really working through those those challenges and those problems and really having parents support that that at home as well. Yeah, I think when we talk about these kind of life skills and uh, focusing on more adaptive skills, we sometimes talk about it or think about it as an either or with academic mm -hmm. skills. How do we do both? Because we know we, we still have to give good instruction that's academically focused in high school for all students. You're absolutely right. but. Um, a good thing about this is this is stuff that could be embedded throughout the day and so you make choices you have to problem solve regardless of whether you're in a math class or in your a PE class or social studies you still have to do that so instead of really focusing on I have to teach this skill you just practice it throughout the day from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep and and of course you're at school most of the day but really having that support from caregivers at home as well would okay. be useful. Okay. Um, any tips for teachers who are kind of maybe new to thinking about these kinds of topics? Uh, 
really thinking about fading that adult support as soon as possible, whenever possible. Um, when we think about independence, we think about freedom and thinking about being our own advocate and being able to do things on our own. And that's things like being able to navigate your environment, um, make choices about um, how things affect you, your meals, um, housing, jobs, and so really affording um, students those opportunities throughout their day is important. That's great information, Stacey. Thank you so much. Uh, so for more information about transition, independent living, and lots of other topics, check out our website at vcuautismcenter.org. So here on our first slide here, we have who does the planning and why. So transition planning, when it comes to the IEP, can sometimes include having additional members who might not normally be part of the IEP meeting. And while you as the youth, your attendance at the IEP meeting isn't required, the school is still supposed to invite you. And your dreams, goals, wishes, the things that you want out of life do guide, are supposed to guide the decisions about which transi transition services that you'll, that are needed for you. Uh, so even if you don't attend your IEP meeting, that IEP team, whoever it's comprised of, your teachers, your parents, et cetera, they still need your input. You still need to share with them what you want after high school, like what you want to go once you graduate, what you need to do, and all that, and all those things. Uh, so, and so kind of think about how can your family help you have meaningful participation in your IEP meeting. So when you meet with your family, you can have a discussion about your hopes and wants for the future. Uh, you can use, we have some resources as part of this presentation. We have like kind of a transition checklist that you can use that helps fill in like the, your strengths and your needs, likes and interests. So you can kind of have like a list of what you're interested in, what you need, what you're good at. You can have that list prepared before you attend an IEP meeting. And then of course, when you know your IEP meeting is coming up, start preparing for it and you may even find it helpful to prepare like a presentation of some kind with either to help with someone from school or your family to better communicate your strengths and goals to the team and then when it comes to things like tests or new about evaluation start being discussed you might want someone who can better explain the results of those evaluations at the meeting so other schools additional school staff may include having transition staff, having your guidance counselor there, uh, a work coordinator, or like an employment specialist, or even a service learning coordinator. And with the parent's permission, or yours if you're 18 years of old, 18 years of age, uh, the school must invite a representative of any participating agency likely to be responsible for providing or paying for transition services. This can include people such as a county social worker, a vocational rehabilitation counselor, college school staff, and medical or other related service providers. Your parents or even you may invite anyone, including staff of other organizations with knowledge or special expertise about you, such as family, friends, mentors, or just other people in the community. You can invite those kind of those types of people to your IP meeting when it comes to transitioning and preparing for independent life after school. So now we're going to look at the transition planning process in the IEP. So for some of you, uh, there may be other public agencies to help map the course. You may need ongoing support to live in the community. There are programs offered through the county, throughout the county that should be explored while you are still in school, and a link between you and these people should be made. Many of these agencies may have eligibility requirements, fees, and even waiting lists. So this is a, gr a good time now to start look, thinking about what type of supports you might need in the community once you start living on your own or you transition out of your household. Uh, so you want to start kind of getting an idea of what services are available in your area and know what you need to do to access those services because they can have certain requirements. They can have waiting lists. Um, some organizations have waiting lists that are several years. Uh, so it's good to kind of know, know what's available to you now so you can start preparing to gain access to that resource. Uh, and the, the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act 
requires that states provide services and supports to people with developmental disabilities and their families. These services can include case management throughout the county, uh, assistance for and applying for benefits, including social security, medical assistance, semi-independent living services, and assistance with housing, social, and recreational needs. So remember when it comes to this, that this is that this is your right and there are people to help you. And then uh, contact other adult service providers that don't require eligibility, such as the Centers for Independent Living or disability specific groups. They may help with teaching self-advocacy, providing written materials and other resources, offering peer support or support groups, as well as giving ideas for assistive technology and providing disability related assessment resources. So some people wonder if at this point, when you're kind of in that, that upperclassman area of high school, some people wonder if parent involvement really matters at this stage of the game. Uh, research has shown that family involvement is a greater predictor of successful outcomes for youth than income or social status. So in addition, students with one or more parents who participate in the IEP meeting during 11th and 12th grades were more likely to be engaged in post-school employment. Students with parents who had high expectations were more likely to be engaged in post-secondary education and employment. And when families remain involved in their children's middle school and high school education, students are more likely to attend school regularly, have a positive attitude about school, earn higher grades, score higher on standardized tests, graduate from high school, and enroll in post-secondary programs. And these, those successes, of course, do matter in the long run. Uh, experts on human development consider a late adolescence to be a launching period when parents help youth develop skills they will need as adults. Parental roles change when a young person graduates from high school and reaches the age of adulthood. They do not end. Um, as someone, as the uh, assistant director of Kentucky Senate, she always says, uh, transition isn't something that ever really ends. You don't, there's not really a point when you leave high school and go into your adult life, there isn't a point where you're done transitioning. It is a constant thing that kind of comes up because always new skills and new challenges will come up during your adult life that you will have to learn how to adapt and adjust to. So it doesn't ever really end. So yeah, and parent membership and transition planning is typically required and essential. His parents can provide a foundation for keeping the transition process grounded and focused on their child's individual strengths, needs, and preferences. Parents know their child's post-secondary education or training and career ambitions and possible support needs. Parents may be able to identify family or community members who can provide additional support. So what your parents can do to help you. So, your parent, so when it comes to transitioning, your parents can help you by communicating and communicating your expectations and holding those expectations. Uh, understanding and taking an active role in your IEP process, supporting your participation in the IEP process making sure your academic skills, self-advocacy skills, and accommodations are addressed. And understand that the school can't and won't do it all. So federal law, so the federal law of IDEA states that transition planning for children with disabilities begins no later than age 16. In Kentucky, transition planning must begin at age 14 or eighth grade. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, guarantees that all children with disabilities have available to them and a free, appropriate public education that provides special education-related services. These services are designed to meet your unique needs and prepare you for employment, college, and training, and when appropriate, independent living. This may include community participation, recreation, leisure, and home living. Parents also transition. They need to learn additional skills when their young adult enters the adult world after high school. Parents may even need training on topics such as disability laws, fostering self-determination and decision-making skills, or learning about adult service systems. Learning how to ask the right questions to the right people is also a key skill. Parents are the investigators of what might be available far enough in advance in order to make decisions soon enough to prevent a gap. It is very important to work with your parents and discuss your wants and needs as you begin and continue through the transition process. You will begin to take on more responsibility and parents will need to find, will find new ways to provide the support you need. Parental roles, change when you graduate from high school and reach the adult age of adulthood, they do not end. So 
as you get older and you get ready and you start leaving high school and start going into your your own living your the roles of your parents do change they're still there to support you but there there's not as much there might not be as much responsibility as there originally was as it becomes more dependent on you to take care of your own needs however your parents should still be there to support you You are the key to your success. So while parents are important, you are at the center of your transition planning. As you move toward adulthood, the family and your IEP team will support you as you look at these big questions. So why are you so important? You all have history that you need to carry forward into adulthood. You know what's worked and what hasn't worked so well. You know about your whole life, not just parts of it. So that, that essentially just means that when you're in that transition planning, you know yourself better than anyone else. You've lived your life better than anyone else has. No one else can say that they've lived your life better than you. That doesn't make any sense. So you have the history. You know what you've been through. You know what works for you. You know it doesn't work for you. And that's why you are crucial in that transition planning. Because you know what works. You know it doesn't work. And you can help navigate them to provide the resources for you that you need. Uh, keep high expectations for yourself. that will help build your strengths, interests, and needs. that will help you achieve independence and self-sufficiency. Uh, also, ask the excess support to help you make informed choices and decisions. Remember, you are a crucial member of your IEP team. Uh, your parents' place on your IEP team may formally end when you become the legal age of majority, which is 18 in Kentucky. Uh, essentially, it just means that once you turn 18, your rights are yours. So that means things like the IEP is now yours, and you now have the choice of who to invite and who not to invite, and your parents are no longer required to attend. Um, however, you can still invite your parents to these meetings to assist you with your IEP if you want to. Your parents often become the transition expert or case manager when you graduate. So being involved in the school transition process will help you understand the options you have and gain the skills they need to learn in your new role in adulthood. You will start to take on more responsibility and find new ways to receive supports. It's important that you remember that while your parents' role will change when you graduate from high school and reach the age of adulthood, it doesn't end. Your maturity, cultural values, and other individual needs will determine the kind of family support you will need as you transition into adulthood. And a few tips for transition planning that we have is um, everything takes twice as long as it's supposed to, so prepare for that. There will be lots of trial and error, so start now. Always try to have a plan A and a plan B, and even a plan C for when something goes wrong. And you are often the case manager after high school, so begin communicating and working as a team with others now. What can you do now? Developing self-advocacy skills. So you'll need to start developing specific skills to prepare for this journey. Independent living skills will be needed whether or not you plan to attend college. For example, when your family or a case manager are not there to manage schedules and paperwork, organization and time management may be a difficult challenge. You'll need to accept and understand your disability, know the accommodations you need, understand how your disability affects you, and have the self-advocacy skills needed have the self-advocacy skills needed to request and obtain those accommodations. And as well as daily living skills, such as money management and self-care and social skills will be needed to navigate adult life. So essentially just start preparing the, those organization skills, those time management skills, be ready to I try to do your best to understand your disability if you don't yet, just so you can have a better time getting those accommodations that you need in adulthood and start learning things like how to manage money and how to better take care of yourself if that's not something that you've really thought about or really capable of doing right now. And your family and IEP team can support you to develop and best understand these skills that you need to be successful after high school. Uh, a part of self-advocacy is to practice disclosing to teachers, coaches, friends, and family members about your disability. I always, this is something that I get asked a lot about, about if people I know have asked me about, like, do you, should you disclose your disability? Is that a good idea? I can never give a good definitive answer on that because in some cases, like when it comes to seeking employment, um, I've had trouble where I have disclosed my disability and I have potentially not gotten a job because of that even though that is technically against the law, but there's no way to really prove that, if that is the reason why you don't get a job, et cetera. But I, I, like, I always say that 
if you have a disability and it affects your life, I think it's best to disclose it and talk about it if you're comfortable talking about it, whether than not. Uh, so I, I say they go ahead and start practicing being more comfortable with, with that and sharing it as needed. Uh, pay attention to the sorts of accommodations that you need and work to make a list, have a list of the accommodations that you need and add to it as you think of things. And make sure that your final school special education evaluation is within three years from when you exit high school, from when, you, when you're supposed to exit high school, I should say. Uh, make sure your medical documentation is up to date. Explore post-secondary options and create a timeline or checklist of tasks. And when touring colleges, set up a meeting with the Disability Service Office. And ask your family, ask your family to plan to visit a local community college disability service office by your junior year in time to learn to use assistive technology or try out possible accommodations while you're still in high school. And then as well as, of course, take and retake entrance exams like the ACT, SAT, all that, all that testing that I'm sure all the all the students that we have present are well aware of. Uh, working with your family at home and with the IEP team will help you develop these skills before leaving home. It will increase your chances of success into adulthood. So how can you, how you can go from here to there? So think of your current skill and experience level as to here in this example, and your hopes for college or training, employment, and independent living after high school is to there. Your family wants to help you achieve your own dreams. This requires early planning and the active involvement of you as much as possible in the process. You and your family's involvement in the transition process includes becoming aware of your options, inviting new people into your life, staying flexible, asking questions, and advocating for your needs. Explore what's possible. It can be challenging to figure out what to expect for your future, especially when you want to work and live independently, but not understand what possibilities are available for you. Understanding what's possible is a great beginning step to creating a vision for your future. You and your family need to know what's out there and they're out to get there. And learning about possibilities, uh, you need to meet or talk with other individuals and parents of older children with your disability. Check out your area's independent living center, vocational rehabilitation center, disability organizations, and as well as PACERS. PACER also has a transition and employment center. If you have a county social worker, he or she may be willing to provide examples of how other young adults with similar needs are meeting your post-school goal, school goals in your community. And for the last example is to become, a, become an adult services detective. Visit a community college and meet with the disability services staff about entrance requirements, the accommodations and supports they provide, and the range of abilities of their student body. Start attending transition resources fairs with your family. Prepare questions and discuss what you learned afterwards. Connect with other parents and young adults of your age and share what you've discovered. As you plan and help outline clear goals and dreams with your parents, your chances of achieving these dreams and goals will increase. So things I know. Independent living is more than just living on your own. There is a lot of things I know and keep in mind that have to do or to have help with. All of these things will need planning and practice. Some of these things you might already know or know how to do or can identify someone to help you with things like self-advocacy, housekeeping, housekeeping, home maintenance, budgeting, shopping, transportation, making appointments, and knowing about your medical history are things to keep in mind. You will also need to assemble your transition team. This means anyone, an organization, or resources that you think you need to be successful. So here we have a little, little diagram of some things. So it goes over, so things to keep in mind is, will I go to college or another type of school to get training after I graduate? What kind of work do I want to do? Where will I go to learn the skills to do that work? Where and how do I want to live? What, do I, what will I want to do for fun? Where will I belong? Who will I hang out with? How will I get places? To get your desired outcome, you need to ask yourself, what skills do I need to learn? What support will I need to have? And who can help me get to where I want to go? So this is the time to start mapping your dreams for the future. And we're going to take a look at some ways to do that at school and at home. So exploring options. Will you have the skills to live, learn, and work in the community? 
So with independent living skills, can you look for and find a job? Can you take medication as directed or follow a diet? Do you make good choices about what to do and who to spend time with? Do you know and understand your rights? Do you make safe choices around your home? And can you decide who you want to represent your interests and support you? Start to consider how you might be able to do the things you're interested in as an adult without the school or your parents providing direct support. Uh, being involved in the community and having a strong social network is an important part of your future independent life. Being involved in the community will help build confidence and is also a great way for you to make friends. Think about getting involved in maybe community theaters, museums, art galleries, places of worship, libraries, community education programs, park programs, and youth organizations. You can look into places to volunteer, including food pantries, recreation programs, nonprofits, um, your school or hospitals, retirement homes, and one-time events such as fundraisers. And what kind of things do you enjoy now that you can easily transfer to your adult life? Like things like art, doing sports, or going to the movies. Once you are an adult, staying involved in recreational activities may require more effort. Explore different activities available during school, after school, and in summer. Talk to a school counselor to find out what activities are available at school. Appropriate extracurricular and non-academic activities must be made accessible for students with disabilities. Try to use natural supports as much as possible because these supports are often needed when school ends. Find things to do at home, such as gardening, uh, building projects, music, computer activities, uh, writing stories, arts and crafts, photography, reading, and exercise. Consider programs, consider the programs in your community as well. So some programs are for everyone, while others are specifically designed for people with disabilities. Examples of places to look for these opportunities include summer camps, community recreation programs, community education, the Special Olympics, and the Centers for Independent Living. Now, supportive decision making. Using friends, family members, professionals, and community resources to help you understand different choices and options you can and options so you can make your own decisions. So supporting decision making here just slide just to go a bit more in detail is just using people you know who know you and professionals to help you understand your different options and to help you make the best decision for you. So assembling your team can be um, members of your family, your teachers, uh, your therapist, and community supports, and just anyone else that you think can help you with your supportive decision making. So transition to independent living, exploring options. So begin working now on the skills you need to have when you start living independently. These skills you learn now will help you to be confident and capable of living independent. Home living means more than just a place to live. It also includes transportation, self-advocacy, money management, medical, and support services. You may need to develop independent skills in one, some, or even all of these areas. You and your parents will need to explore the areas, areas in which you can be and want to be independent. Since where you will live is so important, you and your parents should discuss all of your options and possibilities. So a few different options you have when it comes to independent living is living at home. You can still be somewhat independent and live at home with your family. Families can set roles and responsibilities for every member in the household. Living in an apartment, if you rent, you'll probably not have to mow the yard or do building repairs, but you may need to know how to live with roommates. If you're living in your own home, like if you just get access to another house, you will be responsible for taking care of everything, like repairs, and just all, all the things like mowing the lawn and all any kind of like house upkeep, you will be responsible for taking care of. But there's usually more living space and you can make changes such as paintings or installing any kind of flooring. You get you get a bit more option if you want to like renovate the house, if you want to get in all that. Um, or living alone with support services. This is often a rental situation, but this allows for independent living with the support staff. And then there's group homes. This is a place where small groups of people with disabilities live together. Usually an organization manages the home and hires staff to oversee activities of the residents. And then there's subsidized housing, which is a program that allows people that qualify to make reduced rent payments and the government pays the rest. This is a good option for someone on a fixed income, but there is often a waiting list for these kinds of programs.
transition in the IEP. So this graphic here is kind of a map of uh, secondary transition planning in the IEP. Uh, this begins with an evaluation and leads to the goals, services, and courses of study as steps on the pathway to achieve long-term goals for adulthood. Uh, so an evaluation forms the foundation of the IEP. Your IEP team, including you and your parents, will collect information needed to determine your current skills and abilities, strengths, interests, and preferences, academic and activities of everyday life needs, long-term goals for learning, and the impact of your disability on reaching these goals. With this information, your team will develop a program like the IEP to help pave a path from where you are now, which is the here, to where you hope to be in the future. Your IEP team uses transition assessments, tests, parent concerns, your input, professional school and other agencies input, your progress and special education to identify your present levels of performance and then develop the IEP. The IEP must include long-term workable goals for after high school in the areas of education, training, and employment, as well as independent living. Even though you may not know what they want to do in the future, it's still important to begin to figure that out. So some initial long-term goals and what supports you may need to develop those long-term goals. Working backwards with the end result in mind um, is always a good idea because it helps you, it can help you gain skills and the connections needed to achieve these outcomes working with your IEP team to address these questions. So what transition services, course of study, activities and supports do you, or do you think are necessary each year to move forward achieving your plans and dreams? What after school clubs or club activities might help support your IEP goals? When deciding what activities and goals to include in your IEP, you and your family will want to think about whether progress on the goal or what the activity who may be closer to being successful in your high expectations for learning, living, and working. And then here for our last thing here on this slide, we have create linkages. So when other agencies or service providers will be involved with you after graduation, the IEP should create the contacts and links needed. Your parents or you at the age of 18 can request that the school invite these people to come to your IEP meetings or they may invite them directly. So now we're gonna look at how you and your family can help map these goals in each of the three transition areas. So talking with each other, uh, think about these questions with your parents. Think about like where you want to live, what you want to do in your community, what are some of your favorite recreation and for fun activities? How do I connect with people in my community? And what are three activities that I would like to do in the future? Decide together what information you would like to share with your IAP team. We'll set a destination and map a course. So you can practice independent living skills while still living at home. Working with your parents and the many activities required to run a household, go to work and live independently in the community is the real, really the only way to build the skills you need. You need to know where you're going so you can figure out the route you need to take to get there. So some things to start practicing, getting some skills to start working on ahead of time if you don't already have them is to start practicing good personal hygiene uh, such as taking showers and brushing your teeth regularly. Ask your caregiver to assign household chores to you if you don't already have those kinds of responsibilities. So work to become responsible for those chores and making sure to complete it on time. Find time to learn to do your own laundry. Having someone help you learn to sort your laundry by color, using appropriate amounts of laundry soap, selecting correct load, sides, load sizes, drawing on, drawing on the appropriate setting, folding your laundry and putting it away. You know, you'll need to be able to do this often so you can learn how to do your own laundry once that you're at that point. And lastly, well, managing your, knowing how to manage your own money. Uh, this step is important for you to be able to live independently. There are many apps out there that can help with budgeting. And then lastly is making sure you know all the medications you take, what they're for, and when to take them. And then here... We also have uh, start scheduling your own doctor's appointments, have your parents write down questions to ask your doctor, uh, check into your appointment yourself when you arrive, order your own prescription refills from the pharmacy, practice what to do in emergency situations and practice knowing who to call for help in an emergency situation. Try using public transportation on your own if it's available in your area. Have someone help you learn how to read bus schedules, pay and write the bus. Um, if you won't be using public transportation, transportation, think about who you'll need to reach out to for transportation needs. 
look for ways to turn interest into real skills and social experiences. If going to the movies is one of your favorite things to do, make plans to invite a friend and decide on a plan for transportation to and from that movie. You can open a joint checking account with your parents so that they can teach you how to write a check, use a debit card, deposit money, and withdraw cash. And then lastly here for this, we have get several copies of an apartment application just to learn how to fill out a form for an apartment, just so you can practice for that potential reality in the future, learning how to properly apply for an apartment and how to apply for housing. And here, this is just a bunch of resources um, that kind of just help for supported decision making. Uh, this is at, at the end what well, we have we send the PowerPoint out so and it has all these links here on it so I'm not going to go super into detail about all these it's, these are just various links that help that will help you make your own decisions and help you find people to help you make those decisions and then this is just some more planning resources just to kind of help you um, prepare yourself help you and your parents or caregivers prepare you for independent living, as well as some Kentucky-specific resources, like the, as a link to the Vocational Rehabilitation Services website, as well as the Centers for Independent Living that we've talked about a little bit, and just a few other um, resources that are unique to Kentucky that can help you. And then we have this nice little uh, set of infographics here that again, with, there's a link in the PowerPoint for you to download it. It's also on the Kentucky Spin website. You can find it there if you're interested in any of these. Uh, they just go over things like there's this really simple infographic to talk about things you need to live independently. Uh, there's the goals sheet that I mentioned earlier about how to prepare for your transition and the things that you need to write down and keep, um, keep in mind. And then here we have our resources for Kentucky Spin. This is all on our website. It's also the relevant resources are linked here in the PowerPoint for you. So we have like our youth webpage, which has a bunch of other stuff, like it has, a, it has all the links here on our youth webpage as well as additional stuff. Um, and then I, I like to point out that we have our transition planning link, our grocery shop shopping resources, but there's a video there that kind of goes over a lot of different ins and outs of taking care of your own groceries if you're living on your own, how to be more dependent on keeping things like how you're going to get to the grocery store, how are you going to um, check your groceries to make sure if they need to be thrown away or keeping track of what time they need to go out, how to pay for your groceries. It goes into a lot of that. It also has some things like a, a helpful grocery shopping checklist, as well as we do have a time management resource and a managing your money um, infographic that just kind of goes over different ways to access your money and the pros and cons of using cash versus using a credit card, things like that. And then here we have one more video to kind of close out. Um, so I'll give it back over to Davis to play this last video and then we'll have a little closing and then we'll have um, time for questions. As you can see, I was born without fingers on my right hand, and also my right leg was several inches shorter than my left one. They broke the bones in the leg, then they screwed metal spikes into the bone. It has not only spikes, but wires that go all the way through the leg to stabilize it. I have to walk on it. I have to stretch it out so that my muscles don't just get all atrophied. People always ask me, does it hurt? Yes, it does. But I focus on what I can do, not on what I cannot do. I want to talk with you guys about overcoming obstacles. Everybody has obstacles, a disability, a hurdle. We face a choice. Let the obstacle overcome you or overcome the obstacle. Maybe some of you have heard of Jim Abbott. He was a Major League Baseball player. He won a gold medal in the Olympics. He played for the Yankees, the Angels, but he threw a no-hitter and he only had one arm. When he was a kid, he came home mad one time and told his dad, the kids won't let me play baseball because I only have one hand. His dad replied, no, the kids won't let you play baseball because you stink at baseball. <laughs> you can't change the fact that you only have one hand, but you can change the fact that you stink. So his dad began to practice with him, and he got good. He overcame obstacles. 
teams would try to exploit his weak side. They would try to bunt to the side that he had a missing arm. But they never succeeded because he practiced and practiced fielding bunts to that side. There is no dishonor in having a disability. And I won't let anyone diss my ability, but I don't want anyone's pity either. I will not use the obstacles I face as an excuse for having a pity party. I will practice harder, play harder, and push myself harder to keep getting better. Last season, I started on my varsity high school basketball team as a freshman, and I won Rookie of the Year. Um, I was one of the top scorers on the team. So. One of the things that I find funny is that people judge me by appearance. They say, oh, look at this one-handed whitey with the limp. I don't want him on my team, you know? But what they don't know is that I don't just have a disability, I have an ability. One of my favorite moments from this last season was we played a team that we had never played before. And when the game started, you could tell that they were dissing my disability. I mean, they, they double teamed our tallest player. They just were playing really soft on me. And they just, you could tell, they thought, what can this guy with one hand do? So they left me open for a three. I made that one. They left me open for another one. I made that one. Then they started to get frustrated, so they actually fouled me. I made both free throws. And they called timeout. And as we were in the huddle, I could hear the other coach yelling at his players about me. They went from not covering me at all to double teaming me. It's all about overcoming obstacles. It's true, I have a disability, but so do you. I also have an ability, so do you. Everyone has obstacles to overcome. Some are visible like mine, some are less visible. Maybe your obstacle is that you come from a poor neighborhood. Maybe people say you'll never amount to anything. Prove them wrong. Maybe your obstacle is that you have a learning disability and people think that you're dumb. Prove them wrong. Maybe people judge you because of the color of your skin or your family background. Prove them wrong. I know a lot of people who take one look at me and judge me. They say, oh, that kid can't be any good at basketball. One leg, one hand. If someone thinks you can overcome the obstacles, prove them wrong. So here, just at the for our last um, for our last slide here, we just have um, have a nice QR code. Uh, we asked that everyone who participated fill out our evaluation. Uh, it helps us out a lot. Lets us know what we can do better and what we did good. Um, this just has all of our content information. Feel free to call us or email us. Reach out to us if you'd like. And I think we have a little bit of time. I don't know if anyone has any questions, things like that. We do have a little bit of time to um, answer those, though, however. Feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. But other, otherwise, um, I'll leave a few, like a minute or two for that. But again, if you could just fill out our evaluation, that's super helpful for us. And you can check out our web page is the other QR code on the right. That goes to our youth web page, which has all of our youth-related resources that we've been working on a lot this past year. And again, we just have all of our nice contact info here. So feel free to reach out. It's completely free. Everything we do is free. So if you just want to reach out, just looking for support, participating, and coming to our, um, coming to our webinar. Nick, thank you so much. That is tons of great information. And I was excited to listen to all of it. And I hope everyone out there was as well. Um, we do apologize that we went over the time limit, but as you can see, transitioning is so vast. There's a lot of things that we have to learn. So Nick did a great job in kind of wrapping it all up for us. If you have questions, feel free to contact Nick or through Kentucky SPIN website. Um, please take the time to complete our evaluation and include topics that you would like us to speak about in the future. We take the feedback very seriously and we are here to serve you in ways that are meaningful to you. So make sure you click on the QR code, um, scan it. That's gonna take you straight to the evaluation 
And um, then you can complete it. You'll get a certificate of attendance that can go in your file and that's gonna be emailed directly to you. So we would also wanna encourage you to sign up for the Kentucky Spin e-news. We do have two monthly newsletters. We have an e-newsletter and youth news, which is directed specifically towards youth. Um, and that is the best way to access all of our newest materials and learn about upcoming events. We do these uh, transition Tuesdays every month. Next month, we're gonna be talking about internet responsibility, which is a great topic to tune into. So I would like to thank you all very much for attending today and we look forward to seeing you next time.